So we are now into our uh, last topic for the human body, the back and spine. <coughs> Apologies for being late. I had a previous engagement that I could not <coughs> that I could not uh, escape from. <coughs> anyway. So let's do this and wrap up our discussion. So <clears throat> let's take a look at the back and particularly the vertebra column. So the vertebra is a support structure of the body which is located centrally. It protects the spinal cord, the sensitive, the uh, vulnerable part of our nervous system is encased within the vertebral column. Aside from protecting the spinal cord, the vertebral column also supports <coughs> the weight of the body, including the head and the trunk. It also allows transmission of, of the weight to the hip bones and the lower limbs so that uh, the force of gravity will not pull down the head and the trunk. Also, the vertebral column is characterized by its flexibility and by its segmentation. So the vertebral column is divided into several <coughs> sections. You have your cervical vertebra, you have your thoracic vertebra, and you have your lumbar vertebra. <coughs> so this is the anterior view of your uh, vertebral column. It shows to you your atlas and your axis, C1 and C2 respectively. And of course, the junction between your C7 and your T1 vertebra. And of course, the interface between your T12 and L1 vertebra. And lastly, the interface between the L5 and the sacrococcygeal structure. So this is the left lateral view. And this is your posterior view. In between your vertebra, vertebral bones, uh, you will uh, have your intervertebral foramen. So these are located between the vertebra and allows for the distribution of your spinal nerves. So it allows for the exit of your spinal nerve. So looking closely at your lumbar vertebra from L1 to L5, you will see here uh, posteriorly, you will see here posterior to the vertebral body see here the, the pedicel and of course you have your superior articular processes you have your maxillary processes and to the lateral aspect you have your transverse process and possibly you have your spinous process and in between the <coughs> the foramina you will notice here the inferior articular processes and inferior vertebral notch. So your intervertebral foramen are these spaces between the bony vertebra that allows for the exit of your spinal nerves. So make sure that you know how many vertebra are located in the vertebral column. So the curvature of your vertebral column is uh, characterized by the following. In the cervical vertebra, you have uh, what is called uh, posterior concavity. So this is a left lateral view of your vertebra. So your cervix, cervical column actually uh, has a concave shape. It has a concave shape, uh, which is basic technically characterized as lordotic shape, lordosis. Then the thoracic vertebra has a posterior convexity. It has a posterior convexity and uh, it's called kyphosis. Then the lumbar vertebra has a posterior concavity, so, so called lordosis. And your sacral column as a posterior convexity or it's, it's kyphotic. So that is the normal uh, curvature of your vertebral column. 
So for pregnant women, there is an exaggerated, uh, exaggerated uh, uh, posture because of the weight of the baby inside their uterus. So that for pregnant women, there is uh, obvious posterior concav concavity in your lumbar area. So you have uh, lordotic, you have a lordotic uh, position of the vertebral column in pregnant women. However, in old age, you have a more pronounced kyphotic uh, posture or what is called posterior convexity uh, because of the atrophy of your intervertebral discs. So you, you from a straight uh, normal curvature of your vertebral column, giving you straight posture, the, there is a uh, a leaning forward due to the kyphotic uh, shape or curvature of your vertebral uh, thoracic columns. So taking a look at your individual vertebral bones, your thoracic vertebra for instance is characterized by <clears throat> an anterior rounded body and a posterior vertebral arch. So you have a rounded body in the anterior aspect and you have an arch in the posterior aspect. And in between the body and the vertebral arch you have your foramen which encloses the spinal column spinal nerves so you notice also that comparing your comparing your thoracic vertebra and your lumbar vertebra there is a difference in terms of the shape of both the body and of the vertebral arch so your vertebral arch and the posterior portion of your vertebral column consists of a paired cylindrical pedicel at the sides and a posterior lamina so your pedicel your pedicel and a posterior lamina and there are seven processes that arises out of the vertebral arch you have one spinous process then two transverse process at the sides then of course you have your articular processes that allows for the articulation between the vertebral bone above and below that particular column. Your spinous process <coughs> here in this one, this extension at the back of your vertebral arch is directed posteriorly it is the junction of two lamina so your transverse process on the other hand is as the word implies directed laterally it is the junction of the lamina and of the pedicels so both your spinous process and your transverse process serve as levers and attachments for muscles and ligaments your articular processes, on the other hand, there are two pairs of them. Two are superior articular processes, this one, and two inferior articular processes. So your pedicels are not are notched on the upper and lower borders, providing for uh, what's the existence of what is called your superior vertebral notch and your infer inferior vertebral notch. So this is the characteristic uh, notching in the upper and lower borders of your pedicels. So both uh, your uh, body and your, and your arch actually form your intervertebral foramen which transmits your spinal nerves and important blood vessels. So your vertebral foramen is generally shaped uh, as triangular in uh, appearance and 
You see, there's a large space that allows for the transmission of your spinal nerves and blood vessels. The superior articular processes, on the other hand, this one here, are small, flat, and usually they face backward and upward. So they face backward and upward. Your inferior articular processes, on the other hand, face downward and forward, so that they will uh, articulate with each other, the superior and inferior articular processes. Your, fra your foramen transversum or your transverse processes, uh, on the other hand, allow for the passage of vertebral artery and veins. While your spines, your spinous processes, on the other hand, are usually small in the cervical vertebra and they are characterized as bifid. So there is uh, a bifid appearance. So this is the characteristic appearance of the spine of your cervical vertebra, the exception of which is your uh, seventh cervical vertebra, a spinous process. The body usually of your cervical vertebra is small, broad, and are joined by two synovial joints on each side. So what are the typical cervical vertebra? Your first cervical vertebra are not typical cervical vertebra. It's called atlas. It is called atlas because it directly connects the vertebral column to the head and neck. So your cervical vertebra has no body and no spine. So it has no body and no spine. It's only composed of an arch. So you have an anterior arch and a posterior arch. And you have a lateral mass on each side. So that uh, you have uh, articular surfaces that allow it to connect with the occipital condyles of the skull. And then the lower aspect connects with the axis below it, cervical, your cervical uh, tube. A vertebra. So your C2 or cervical vertebra, second cervical vertebra is called your axis. It has characteristic odontoid processes which are peg-like uh, uh, process that project upward from the superior surface of the body so that it's like uh, uh, it articulates with your uh, axis, allow, allowing the axis to to rotate around the the cervix, uh, around the around the atlas, uh, uh, allowing the atlas to rotate around the axis. So your uh, axis represents the body of atlas that has fused with the axis. Your rotating process represents the body of atlas that has fused with the axis. Another typical vertebra is your C7, characterized by a very long spinous process. In fact, it is the longest spinous processes. It is not also bifid, unlike your other cervical vertebra. It has a large transverse process and a small foramen and uh, does not transmit the vertebral artery in the small foramen transverse uh, transverse arm. So this transverse foramen does not transmit the vertebral artery. Let's now go to your thoracic vertebra, which is characterized by a body that is heart-shaped and medium-sized. So heart-shaped, medium-sized uh, body, and the vertebral foramen is usually small and circular, while the spine is long and inclined downward. Uh, it has a characteristic uh, costal facet that are present on both sides and on the transverse process. So here you have your costal facet. However, your T11 and your T12 has no facets on the transverse processes. Your spare articular processes on the other hand of the thoracic vertebra faces backward and laterally while the inferior articular processes faces forward and medially. 
the lumbar vertebral lumbata and is characterized by a body that is kidney shaped and big and large the pedicels are strong the lamina is thick and the vertebral foramina is triangular while the transverse processes are long and slender so the, the structure of a lumbar vertebra by the very shape itself shows you that it's a very uh, it's a weight bearing it's a weight bearing structure so the spinous processes are short and flat and quadrangular and they project backward while their superior articular processes face medially and inferior articular processes faces laterally your lumbar vertebra has no rib facets and does that has no foramina in the transverse processes unlike your other uh, upper uh, vertebra your sacral vertebra on the other hand has five rudimentary vertebra that are fused together so actually it's a single body uh, it's called a single wedge shaped bone because of the fusion of S1 to S5 uh, vertebra it is characterized by a uh, sacral promontory whose anterior upper margin is a first sacral vertebra and it bulges into the pelvic cavity and it is an important obstetric landmark so this is your sacral promontory so it bulges into your uh, pelvic cavity so this is a plain uh, inlet pelvic inlet and this is your pelvic outlet and the sacral promontory it's cut up its uh, shape and its uh, position actually determines the size of your plane of your pelvic inlet and also the coccyx uh, here also determines the the diameter of your outlet so your sacral vertebra are characterized by uh, the fact that it contains uh, your sacral canal which is formed by your sacral foramina so you have a sacral canal which contains parts of the cauda equina and the meninges up to the lower border of your uh, S2 and you also contains your lower sacral nerves lower sacral nerves your coccygeal nerve and your phylum terminale there is a so called uh, sacral hiatus which is due to the failure of the fifth and fourth sacral vertebra to meet in the midline and there is an anterior and posterior sacral foramina that allows for the passage of the anterior and posterior rami of the upper four spinal nerves your sacral vertebra has uh, several articulation the upper border of the base uh, articulates with the fifth lumbar vertebra while the narrow inferior end articulates with the coccyx and laterally it articulates with your hip bones and your sacroiliac joint lastly your coccygeal vertebra is actually composed of four uh, small vertebral bones that are fused together so they are now considered as a single uh, vertebral structure it is usually small and triangular however sometimes the first coccygeal vertebra is commonly not fused with the second vertebra so you could have a, a separate delineation of the first co coccyx coccyx bone from the other three uh, allowing allowing the flexibility for the vertebral column necessitates uh, that it has a flexible joint so you have several joints connecting the different bones of the vertebral column you have your atlanto occipital joint between the between the atlas and the occiput you have your atlanto axial joints between c1 and c2 you have the joints of the vertebral column below the axis you have the joints between two vertebral bodies you have the intervertebral discs and you have the joints between the vertebral arches taking a look at your uh, atlantoccipital joints 
You will have uh, occipital condyles on both sides of the foramen magnum and facets on the superior su surfaces of the lateral masses of the atlas. It is enclosed by a capsule. Your occipital joints also has several supporting ligaments, including your anterior occipital membrane, where, where the anterior arch of atlas is connected to the anterior margin of the foramen magnum. You have the posterior occipital membrane, where the posterior arch of atlas is connected to the posterior margin of the foramen magnum. It allows for flexion, extension, and lateral flexion of the, of the joint. Your atlanto axial joints allows for movement from side to side, while your atlanto occipital joint allows movement, uh, uh, allows for nodding movements. So your atlanto axial joint is a synovial joint also, just uh, just like your atlanto occipital joint. The odontoid process and the anterior arch of the atlas articulates with the lateral masses of the two bones. It's enclosed by a capsule and allows for the rotation of the atlas with head on the axis. The ligaments in the atlant oxal joints include your apical ligament and your alar ligament. The apical ligament uh, connects the apex of the odontal process to the anterior margin of the foramen magnum, while your alar ligament connects the odontal process with the middle side of the occipital condyle. Another ligament is your crochet ligament which allows for the transverse part of the odontal process to the anterior arch of the atlas while the verti vertical part of the body of axis is connected to the anterior margin of the foramen magnum. While your membrana tectoria allows for the upward continuation of the posterior ligament and attaches to the occipital bone. Joints that join the vertebral column below the axis include cartilaginous joints between the vertebral bodies and synovial joints between the articular processes. Mm -hmm. So, taking a look at the joints between two vertebral bodies, it is usually covered by a template of hyaline cartilage. So, the intervertebral disc mm -hmm. is actually hyaline cartilage, fiber cartilage in between the two vertebra, and they unite very strongly the two bod the bodies of the vertebra. In terms of ligaments, your vertebral bodies are connected by anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. These are continuous bands down the anterior and posterior surface at the vertebral column that stretches down from the skull to the sacrum. Your invertebral discs usually are characterized by the following. It is usually about one fourth or twenty five percent of the length of the vertebral column. So uh, it's actually 25% of the height of the vertebral column. It is thicker in cervical and lumbar regions, uh, indicating that they are weight-bearing regions. Your annulus fibrosus forms the periphery of the, of the, this is your annulus fibrosus, forms the periphery of the disc. It is a fibrocatalogenous structure, uh, composed of collagen fibers arranged in alternating concentric layers, provide, providing it with tensile strength. Uh, the nucleus fulposus at the center of the intervertebral disc is an ovoid mass of gelatinous material and uh, usually uh, uh, persists pressure. However, with advancing age, there is a decrease in water content and it is gradually replaced by fibrocartilage just like your annulus fibrosus. So, in between the first cervical vertebra, you will have no disc and the sacrum has no disc and also your coccyx has no disc. In terms of clinical correlations, the nucleus pulposus can actually hernate. They can, it can uh, be squeezed out of your intervertebral disc. It frequently of course in the lower lumbar region. It's the most common place for herniation and also in the lower cervical region. 
This is due to a sudden increase in the compression load on the vertebral column. So if there is increased load, load on the vertebral column, like uh, lifting heavy weights uh, or being uh, traumatized, it will lead to the rupture of your annulus fibrosus and the nucleus pulpos, pulposus will herniate posteriorly into your vertebral canal in it the herniation will cause the compression of the spinal nerve roots spinal nerve or spinal cord causing neurological problems your joints between the two vertebral arteries arches are are called synovial joints also so between adjacent superior and free articular processes it is surrounded by a capsule and uh, also it has several ligaments that supports it including a supraspinous ligaments with connect which connects adjacent spines your interspinous ligaments which connect adjacent uh, spines and ligamentum flabum which connects adjacent lamina your ligamentum nuclei is found in the cervical region and it's a thickening of the supraspinous and infraspinous ligaments so what are the movements that can you see you can see in the vertebral column the type and range of the movements in the region will depend on the thickness of the intervertebral disc and the shape and direction of the articular processes. So flexion or forward movement and extension, backward movement are usually found extensively in the cervical and lumbar regions while they are restricted in the thoracic region due to the presence of the ribs. On the other hand, your lateral flexion or side to side movement in the body uh, is extensive in the cervical region and also in the lumbar region and once again it is restricted in your thoracic region due to the presence of your ribs rotation movement the twisting in the vertebral column is less, ex less least extensive in the lumbar region and uh, circumduction which is combination of all the previous described movements uh, can occur also in the different areas of your uh, vertebral column. Take, let's take a look at your muscles on the back. The muscles uh, can be grouped into superficial, intermediate, and deep or post, post vertebral uh, muscles at the back. So the superficial muscles at the back are connected with the sh shoulder girdle, while the intermediate muscles at the back involved with the movements of the thoracic cage and you finally you have your deep or post vertebral uh, muscles which are actually in the vertebral column already so taking a look first at your post vertebral column it is first and foremost uh, broad thick columns occupying each side of the spinous process so it's actually occupying your spinous process on each side and your spines and your transverse processes serve as the levers uh, of this particular muscle so it's well developed in humans so when you classify your uh, different post vertebral muscles you can take a look at the superficial running muscles your erector spinae your erector spinae muscle uh, on the medial side medial to your uh, lateral to your uh, vertebral column you have your erector spinae composed of your iliocostalis muscle longissimus muscle and spinalis muscle which moves uh, medially while your intermediate oblique, right, uh, intermediate oblique muscles are your transversal spinalis they are your semispinalis your, rotator, your rotatoris and your multifidus while the deepest muscles are your interspinalis and intertransversari muscles so the muscles that are longest lie most superficial. So these are your erector spinae muscle, while your intermediate uh, length run obliquely from the transverse processes to the spine, while the shortest and the deepest muscles run from the spine to the transverse processes of the adjacent vertebra. Now let's take a look at the different muscular triangles located in the back. You have what is called your auscultatory triangle, whose, which is the site on the back where breath sounds are most easily heard by, by a stethoscope. And its boundaries are, are the latissimus dorsi muscle, 
your trapezius muscle in the medial border of the scapula and your rhomboid major which forms the the floor of that particular oscillatory triangle your lumbar triangle on the other hand is the site where pus a viral infection may emerge from the abdominal wall and it is bounded by your latissimus dorsi by your posterior border of the external oblique and by the iliac crest let's take a look at the arterial supply of the back the arterial supply of the back uh, is provided for by several uh, blood vessels in the cervical region you have your occipital artery vertebral artery deep cervical artery and your ascending cervical artery in the thoracic region you have your posterior intercostal arteries and in the lumbar region you have your subcostals and your lumbar arteries and in your sacral region you have your iliolumbar arteries and lateral sacral arteries the venous drainage of the back is composed of veins uh, forming complicated plexuses which extend along the vertebral column from the skull to the coccyx you have your external vertebral venous plexus which lies external to the vertebral column and you have your internal vertebral plexus which you see here which lies within your vertebral canal so you also have your venous drainage of the back there is a free communication between the plexuses connecting the neck the thorax the abdomen and the pelvis and you would know that given this free communication between different plexuses from the neck to down to the pelvis that any malignancy can easily be transmitted from one region to another occurring in the vertebral area it also communicates to the foramen magnum via the sinuses of your cranial cavity the internal plexus communicates with the veins draining vertebral bodies or your bassy vertebral vein and the veins of the meninges and spinal cord your vertebral plexuses also drain into the vertebral intercostal lumbar and lateral sacral veins so as i mentioned earlier these plexuses provide a pathway for the spread of malignant disease from the pelvis to the skull because of the freely communicating uh, plexuses so in terms of lymphatic drainage your superficial limb uh, uh, drains above your iliac crest down to your axillary lymph nodes below the iliac crest it goes to your superficial inguinal nodes however your deep lymphatic drainage or your deep cervical nodes your posterior magistral nodes your lateral aortic nodes and your sacral nodes in terms of innervation the posterior rami of the 31 pairs of spinal nerves supply the skin and the muscles in terms of its corresponding segments and the posterior rami of the C1, C6, C7, C8, L4, and L5 provide uh, innervation for the deep muscles of the back but do not provide innervation for the skin. Let's now take a look at your sp spinal cord. Your spinal cord is cylindrical in shape. It's, it comes from the central nervous system via your medulla oblongata of the brain, begins superiorly in the foramen magnum and ends inferiorly and the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra in adults and it occupies about the upper two-thirds of the vertebral canal it is surrounded by just like your central nervous system is surrounded by three meninges you have the dura mater arachnoid mater and your pia mater additional protection is provided by your cerebrospinal fluid and by the subarachnoid space there are several enlargements or uh, enlargements in the spinal cord in the, in the cervical region you have enlargement in the origin of the brachial plexus and in the lumbar region you have enlargement due to the origin of the lumbar plexus the lower end uh, of your spinal cord uh, ends in the conus medullaris and the filum terminale your filum terminale is actually the prolongation of your pia mater from the conus medullaris to the back of the coccyx so it's just an extension of PM matter and does not, the film terminal does not contain any spinal nerve. Uh, taking a look at the gross uh, cross uh, section of your spinal cord, 
you notice that anteriorly there is an anterior anterior median fissure which is midline anterior surface of the cord and a posterior mid, posterior median fissure which is also midline on the posterior surface of the spinal cord so there are 31 pairs of spinal cords uh, uh, the anterior uh, spinal cord has motor function while posterior spinal cord has sensory function with posterior root ganglion so what are the different roots in the region you have your upper cervical region which is very short and run almost horizontally so uh, in the cervical region short and run almost horizontally uh, the roots in the region where the lumbar, the lumbar and sacral roots below level of determination the cord terminates in the cardia equina so you have the vertical issue of nerves around the phylum terminale and also the cardia equina so you have uh, several roots that uh, are located uh, adjacent to your phylum terminale cardia equina so do your roots pass through the interbitable foramen and they are unite to form your spinal nerves which divides into the anterior ramus which is a large uh, a nerve spinal nerve and your posterior ramus which is a smaller nerve both contain motor and sensory fibers so because there is a union of your anterior ramus which is motor and posterior uh, ramus which is uh, uh, sensory on the other hand the blood supply of your spinal cord uh, arises from the posterior spinal arteries which comes directly or indirectly from the vertebral arteries and they supply the posterior one third of the spinal cord the arteries particularly anterior spinal arteries arise from the vertebral arteries they form to they form the unite to form a single artery which descends in the anterior median fissure so your anterior spinal artery descends in the anterior median fissure and supplies the anterior two-thirds of your spinal cord your radicular arteries on the other hand are branches of regi regional arteries and they just uh, reinforce the anterior and posterior spinal arteries so they, they, they provide redundant backup blood supply to your spinal cord the, the veins on the other hand drains into your internal vertebral venous plexus which we have discussed earlier the neural matter which is a cover of your spinal cord uh, the meninges of your spinal cord is an external membrane it is a dense fibrous tissue which encloses your spinal cord and the cauda equina and it is continuous with the dora covering the brain above and below it ends on the phylum terminale at the level of the lower border of the second sacral vertebra, vertebra. so it gives sheets to all spinal nerve roots your arachnoid matter on the other hand is a delicate and permeable membrane which lies within the dura but outside the pia it is separated from the pia matter which closely invests your spinal cord and spinal nerves by a arachnoid space filled with CSF or cerebrospinal fluid your arachnoid matter uh, is continuous with the arachnoid covering the brain above and below it also terminates on the filum terminale at the lower border of the sacral, second sacral vertebra it continues along the spinal nerve roots forming small lateral extension of subarachnoid space lastly covering of your spinal cord is your pia matter which is a vascular membrane it closely covers your spinal cord is thickened on the other side between the nerve roots which is called your ligamentum dent denticulatum and extends along each nerve root as far as the spinal nerve inferiorly it prolongs off, uh, prolong off the lower end of the spinal cord as the phylum terminale so clinical correlation when you do a lumbar puncture or what is called your spinal tap the patient uh, 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 is placed on the side with the vertebral column flexed just like illustrated in this uh, figure well flexed and then the needle is inserted above or below the fourth lumbar spine so your uh, point of reference will always be L4 and uh, it lies within the imaginary line between the highest point on the iliac crest so as a guide you can use the iliac crest to locate for your L4 
So the needle passes through the foil structures to the arachnoid space to get your CSF. You know, it punctures the skin, the fascia, then it punctures the supraspinous ligament and then the interspinous ligament and then the ligamentum flabum and then the fatty tissue of the internal vertebral venous plexus then it tears into the dura mater and finally your arachnoid matter to enter your subarachnoid space in order to get your CSF so these are the following uh, points that you need to remember uh, the vertebral levels as reference points in the body so for C4 vertebral level your hyoid bone and your bifurcation of common carotid artery your C5 it is at the level of the thyroid cartilage and the carotid pulse palpated C6 is the level of the cricoid cartilage start of the trachea and the start of esophagus T2 is the external notch and the arch of aorta T4 is the sternal angle junction of superior and inferior mediastinum and the bifurcation of trachea T5 and to T7 is your pulmonary hilum and T8 is your inferior vena cava hiatus T9 is your sifo sternal joint T10 is your esophageal hiatus T12 is your aortic hiatus T12 to 11 is your duodenum T12 is your celiac artery in the upper pole of the left kidney L1 is your superior mesenteric artery, upper pole of the right kidney, and the spinal cord in adults, and PA matter. Uh, L2 vertebra, you have renal artery. L3 vertebra is the end of the spinal cord in the newborn, the inferior mesenteric artery, and the umbilicus. L4 is the iliac crest, and the bifurcation of the aorta. S1 is your sacral promontory. S2 is the end of the dural sac. Uh, arachnoid, subarachnoid space, and series F, and S3 is the end of your sigmoid column. So, how many vertebrae are there in the vertebral column? You have 33. In terms of groupings, you have 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, and 3 coccygeal, which is into, which actually is fused into your coccyx. So with that, uh, thank you very much and uh, right after this uh, live stream you can take the quiz, it opens at 4.30 and uh, I wish you good luck in your final examinations next week and uh, happy studying. Thank you for tuning in.